Hello, everybody. I'm Helen Tay. I'm a hepatologist at the University of Chicago Medicine, and I'm grateful to the organizers of this wonderful educational program for giving me the opportunity to participate in it. My task today is to talk to you about keeping your liver healthy. This is the outline of my presentation and we'll briefly cover these four areas to talk about the function of the liver, interpretation of liver chemistry tests, preventing preventable liver diseases, and the impact of medications and herbal supplements on the liver. The liver is an amazing organ. It covers a very wide plethora of functions that the body needs. It is the battery pack of our body and works as the powerhouse of our entire body. The liver is responsible for converting calories that we eat into energy so that we can utilize that for our bodily functions as well as our physical activities. The liver is the one that maintains the blood sugar levels. The liver also produces proteins for clotting whenever we have wounds or bleeding, and it produces hormones, antibodies, and carriers of substances that has to be distributed throughout the body. It converts medications to active forms to allow the medications to work, or for those that are already in active forms, it detoxifies those medicines to allow them to be safely eliminated from our body through our urine or our stool. The liver produces bile that aids in the digestion and absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. It also removes toxins from the body, including ammonia, which is a byproduct of our daily cell turnover. The liver can also store some vitamins and minerals, and it has cells that are specific for filtering bacteria. So when somebody is having a liver panel drawn, that's a blood test, it will usually show all these enzymes that are listed here, as well as the bilirubin. So let's talk a little bit about each one of them. The AST and ALT are enzymes that convert amino acids from one form to another in the liver. These are contained within the liver cells and it tends to leak out whenever the cell membrane integrity is compromised. However, these enzymes are also made by other organs such as the muscles and it can also be released by red blood cells. The alkaline phosphatase is another enzyme that is found in the liver, but this time it's secreted by the bile duct cells. This enzyme increases in the blood level when there is a bile flow problem, but like the AST and ALT, it can also be produced by organs outside of the liver, such as the bone, the intestine, or the placenta. Bilirubin is a substance that is a component of bile, and it adds color to our stool and our urine. This substance becomes elevated in situations where there's severe liver cell damage or severe compromise in the bile flow. So what comprises a healthy liver? A healthy liver has the correct cell components in it and no outsiders allowed within the vicinity. The liver that is healthy can regenerate and can undergo a lot of different treatments or even surgical resections without much compromise in its function. We can technically lose about 70% of our liver and still manage to regenerate what has been lost and survive with the remaining 30%. So if you all remember this mythology about Prometheus who stole the fire from Zeus and as a punishment, Zeus chained him to the rocks and had an eagle come and eat at his liver every day. But because the liver kept regenerating, the eagle had to keep coming every day with no end in sight. So this is one of those mythologies that actually had a scientific basis as much as it has been so long ago. Liver diseases that can be prevented should be prevented to keep a healthy liver. And these diseases could include alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and viral hepatitis. When we take medications that are necessary, but medications that are also known to have a higher risk for causing liver toxicity, it would be prudent to be monitored while these medications are on the agenda. Lastly, I would actually advise extreme caution when taking herbal supplements in general. Herbal supplements are not subject to the same rigorous testing that the medications that are approved by the FDA are subjected to. And therefore, when they hit the shelves, 
their safety and efficacy is pretty much still up in the air. This slide shows uh, some examples of what happens to a liver that becomes unhealthy. So the first picture that we see here in the left upper corner is the picture of a normal liver under the microscope. You can see that the cells are pink and they're filled up with their cytoplasm that is expected in a normal liver cell and the dots there are the nuclei. The next picture in the middle is what we would see in a fatty liver disease patient. You can see that the uh, liver has somewhat been replaced by these holes, which actually are fat droplets that have been washed out during the processing of the specimen. And if you can just imagine, having this fat in each cell will compromise the fun function of that cell. And if there's a significant amount of it, such as what's shown here on this slide, then you can certainly cut down the liver function to a significant degree, and a liver like this would have trouble regenerating. The last picture in the right lower corner here is a picture of a patient who has cirrhosis or severe scarring of the liver. This results from many different liver diseases, not simply just from alcohol alone, but this means that the scar tissue, which is what we see here as blue, has taken over a significant proportion of the liver and therefore the liver cells have been lost. And you can appreciate how much function you've also lost if you have this much scar tissue in the liver. Again, similar to the fatty liver, a liver like this would have trouble regenerating. So let's see what happens uh, with alcohol on the liver. So starting with a healthy liver, if the amounts of alcohol intake are quite significant to the point that it causes liver damage, it will do so by depositing fat in the liver and making the liver enlarged or big. The fat there will at some point elicit an immune response and inflammatory cells will come in and then generate fibrosis or scar tissue. And with the passage of time, the scar tissue adds up and then it becomes what we would now call cirrhosis of the liver or severe scarring of the liver. But then how do we know how much alcohol to drink to be within the safe zone? So the threshold amounts that have been calculated for men is about 30 grams of alcohol per day, and for women, about 10 to 20 grams per day. But how much do we really see in a drink? So this picture here depicts the approximate amount of alcohol in each drink, which is about 14 grams in a 12 ounce of beer, eight ounce of malt liquor, five ounces of table wine, or one and a half ounce of 80 proof spirits. So, so to translate that to what we would call drinks per day, basically a man can drink about two drinks per day and stay within a safe zone. And a woman can drink about one drink per day and stay in the safe zone. But beyond that, one could certainly develop alcoholic liver disease. Of course, there are other factors that contribute to the development of alcoholic liver disease, including the presence of other liver diseases that would potentially allow a more progressive disease or some genetic predisposition as well. Now, some people develop fatty liver but never even touch alcohol. And this is a different disease entity called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which will look exactly the same as alcoholic liver disease under the microscope, except that there is absolutely just no alcohol intake in some of these patients or very little alcohol intake in the others. So what we would see similar to the alcoholic liver disease is that there's the deposition of fat first, that's called hepatic steatosis or fatty liver. And then the spectrum continues to include those patients who may also have inflammatory cells and fibrosis or scar tissue. And that stage is now called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And then as time goes on and the injury continues, those patients can then progress on to cirrhosis of the liver. You can appreciate that there are some reversibility from the stage of fatty liver and the stage of NASH for those who are able to improve their profile and get rid of the fat from the liver. But once cirrhosis has set in, unfortunately, it becomes irreversible. NASH or fatty liver disease or NAFLD happens to be the most common liver disease in our country. We probably have about 25% at least of our population with fatty liver. Why is that? Well, NASH or NAFLD is related to metabolic syndrome. 
What is metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is a conglomeration of different conditions that predispose an individual to stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. So these conditions include obesity or excess weight, particularly if the obesity is mostly around the middle or truncal or abdominal obesity. Hypertension, cholesterol abnormalities, particularly a high triglyceride or a low HDL cholesterol or high density lipoprotein, which is considered the good cholesterol, and resistance to insulin, which is a hormone that regulates the blood sugar levels for our body. And this could predispose to either a pre-diabetic state or move on to a full diabetic state. So for patients who have NAFLD or who are at risk for developing, developing NAFLD, there are some lifestyle choices that have to be made. And diet is certainly one of them. So the Mediterranean diet is the most common advocated diet for patients with fatty liver. I'll go over that in a little more detail in the next slide. But to keep the liver healthy, one should avoid fatty foods and keep saturated fat to less than 10% of the diet. Carbohydrates should be minimized to less than 50% of the total kilocalories consumed. And that means avoiding sweets, avoiding fructose, which is found in soda, avoiding processed carbohydrates, which are what we would see in white flour, pasta, and breakfast cereals. But luckily, for those of you who have um, a vice with coffee or, or a romance with coffee, coffee is protective for the liver. So that's good news. So this is a food pyramid for the Mediterranean diet, which starts with, at the bottom, having a, a healthy physical profile along with a healthy emotional relationship with the family, because you're supposed to eat with the family all the time. So the food that choices at the bottom here consists of whole grain bread, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, as well as fruits and vegetables. And the fat of choice is olive oil. And for the sources of protein, it is seafood and fish, and with only moderate consumption of dairy products or poultry. But the big no-no here in the Mediterranean diet, which should only be consumed on a seldom or a very special occasion basis, are the meats and sweets. Now, what about coffee? Coffee truly has data that says that it reduces the risk for developing NAFLD by 23%. And for those already with NAFLD, coffee reduced the risk for fibrosis by 32%. And even older studies in hepatitis C patients had shown that coffee reduced the risk for disease progression to advanced hepatitis C by 53%. So three cups of black coffee a day keeps fatty liver away. Exercise also has its own role. It has been shown to show an improvement in uh, lipid levels as well as liver, liver enzymes. And it's interesting to see that there have been comparisons of different types of exercises done and its effects on the body function and liver enzymes. For example, aerobic exercises seem to have a broader effect in improving the lipid levels, liver enzymes, as well as the weight of the individual. Resistance exercises does improve lipid levels and liver enzymes, but not necessarily the weight. And high intensity interval training improved liver enzymes alone. Viral hepatitis are now really not very common diseases anymore in the last decade because of all the breakthrough in medications that we have for treating them and for hepatitis C for curing it. But it still merits a mention just to make sure that we are able to uh, exercise caution to prevent these from happening. So hepatitis B is transmit transmitted mostly by sex in our country and therefore practicing safe sex is the way to prevent this. It used to be transmitted by blood transfusions, but it's now being screened for, and therefore that has diminished very much. But in other countries with endemic hepatitis B, the transmission rate is usually from mother to child at childbirth. So screening of pregnant women is a standard of care as well, even here in the United States. But certainly there is a vaccine available for hepatitis B, so it behooves us to be vaccinated for hepatitis B as all children born in the last two or three decades have been subjected to this vaccination as part of the childhood immunization. 
Hepatitis C, on the other hand, is transmitted mostly by sharing of IV drug needles for those who still use IV drugs, and therefore making sure that the clean needles are used is imperative to prevent the transmission. Blood product screening has been done for hepatitis C and has diminished the transmission by this route, and sexual transmission is rare although possible. Moving forward to medications, of course, when we need medications, the benefit of the medication usually outweighs the risk of liver toxicity, which is extremely rare. However, there are still some medications that are more notorious than others in causing liver toxicity or injury, and it's prudent to be monitored for such if one is taking these kinds of medicines. So I have written some examples here of commonly used medications It doesn't, of course, comprise the entire list, but the most common group is usually the antimicrobials or antibiotics. So isoniazid for one is a drug used to treat TB and has known liver toxicity. And minocycline is a drug that's used to treat acne that can also cause liver toxicity. Antiarrhythmics are drugs to treat irregular heart rates and amiodarone is a common one. Immunosuppressants are drugs that are used to treat inflammatory conditions or immune-mediated conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, one of which is methotrexate. Anticonvulsants in the form of valproic acid can lead to liver damage. Anti-inflammatory such as diclofenac sodium and even cancer treatments such as tamoxifen, which is used to prevent recurrence of breast cancer. Now we're going into herbal supplements. This is more of a gray zone even with less data than medications, and therefore it's very difficult to really determine their safety. But in a database that listed all the different causes of liver injury from herbal medications, the group that has the most uh, use uh, that led to liver injury happened to be in the uh, herbal supplements that were used for bodybuilding as well as depression management, followed by herbal supplements used for weight loss. We have to be cautious about what supplements we use, but there certainly have been a few that have been determined to be really safe for the liver. So one of this is omega-3 fatty acid or fish oil. This supplement has been shown to improve liver fat content, the cholesterol or lipid profile, and in the liver enzymes in patients with NAFLD or fatty liver. Silymarin or silibinin, which is commonly known as milk thistle, has decades of data on its safety, so absolutely safe for the liver. The only issue is we don't really have hard data to say that it could really help the liver, although I personally think it might help with some inflammation, but it does not take care of the underlying root of the problem. SAM-E or S-adenosyl L-methionine is Uh, Another supplement that has been shown to potentially reduce bilirubin and AST in patients with chronic liver disease, but it had no direct effect on the clinical outcome of that disease or that patient. Coenzyme Q may reduce liver enzymes as well in fatty liver, but its effect on the clinical outcome is also still unclear. So this list is perfectly safe for the liver, but whether or not they really do something seems to be only verified for the omega-3 fatty acid. So to summarize, a healthy liver can regenerate and can sustain itself through uh, treatments to the liver or even resections of the liver if needed for patients who have a neuroendocrine tumor that has metastasized to the liver. But to keep the liver healthy, we should prevent diseases that are potentially preventable. And we do this by moderation of alcohol consumption picking the right lifestyle choices to prevent or improve fatty liver, and to take precautions to avoid contraction of viral hepatitis. When taking medications that are known to have relatively higher risk for liver toxicity, it is prudent to be monitored with liver tests periodically while on those medications. But we should really be very wary of taking herbal supplements in general, unless the safety of those herbal supplements have really been well established. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.